This video discusses how to set exposure times from wide field fluorescent microscopy for a wide dynamic range with no saturation. The problem with saturation would be a different video or web page. We are going to demonstrate using a slide. But I'm going to do this is a skin sample stained with four different fluorescent probes. We're going to begin with the green channel, but the goal is to have all of the exposures, so exposure time for each channel within a linear range. And we're going to be using this panel on the bottom of the screen, which is a lookup table or a histogram and also display where we can change the raw data appearance on the screen. So you can see on the bottom, this is an indicator of the raw data and the y-axis is an indicator of how bright that looks on the screen based on a current that we apply. And on the left here in this window here is our channels we know we can choose which color we're looking at and the exposure time. Let's go ahead. So one common problem with fluorescence microscopy is that there are bright areas or structures in the sample next to dim or weakly labeled areas. You want to image them both. So it may be a misnomer to call the weakly labels, um, call them weakly labeled because this implies there's something wrong with them. Well, actually, they're labeled great. It's just they have two molecules per volume, and we need to preserve this relationship in the images. So the camera we're using now is 14 bits, which means that it has more than 16,000 intensity values. But the video display on the computer only has 256 values. Also, our eyes aren't very good at seeing more than, let's say, 100 discrete array values. So we have a problem. The main one is that the screen on the computers and our eyes cannot display or see such a wide dynamic range of contrast. So we cannot see over this 16,000 intensity range. Now we can set the exposure for the raw data to not saturate the brightest signal. And the weaker signal will really be in the image, even if we don't see it on the scale. So in an image such as this, the structure on this left is way too bright. It's saturated. And there's no way, no matter how we adjust our contrast, to get any information about what's going on here down. And you can see in our histogram, this peak at the end is showing these saturated pixels. Basically, they've all been compressed together at 16,000 to the other name before. And we can't get them back. However, this region here looks good. But there really is no reason to have to saturate this left in order to see what's going on on the right. Because in fact, the camera only needs a thousand or two counts, intensity counts, in order to get a really nice clean image. So even with the brightest areas not saturated, there is good signal here. So now let's look at an image that has no saturated pixels. So on the left here, we can actually see fine structure. And you can even zoom that up, and you can see fine structure. Now on the left, on the right side here, you don't see the cells. If we do a linear contrast enhancement so that the image looks just like the one that was too bright in the raw data. So this is the one that's too bright with the raw data. This is the one where we actually have a gradient. I the range, no saturation. And you can see they look pretty similar. And we can see the details in here. So we can actually do quantification between the intensities in the bright areas and the dim areas because the underlying raw data are linear with no saturation. So the bright areas are preserved. And we can also do what's called a gamma curve. It's non-linear, and you would have to tell people that you're using it. But you can see with the gamma curve, we can still see the details on the right. Let's tweak the background a little bit. And you can see the dimly stained or weaker signal on the right. So we can measure quantitatively the amount of molecules labeled green across the entire image. Now, if the raw data was saturated, this would not be possible. 
So let's talk about how to actually take. Let's talk about how to actually set up the exposure to take these pictures. So let's look at just the green channel. So I've clicked on green AF488. If we go live, we have a live image. And we can manually change the exposure time. So here we have an exposure time. We can bring it up. Now we're saturated and we can bring it down. And we have a tool that shows us when we saturated our pixel, which is this range indicator button. So if I click on the range indicator, you can clearly see that this is not saturated. We're in a zone. And if you look at the histogram for the lookup table on the bottom, you can see we're using about 50% of our dynamic range. I mean, the exposure time brighter, longer. You can see now we have saturation because the pixel is shown to us as red or saturated. And you can see this peak at the far right. So, manually adjusting these times, we can just keep bringing the exposure time down, the amount of time light is collected for each picture until the image is no longer saturated with the light. Reset the okay, so that's one way to set the exposure time. Now, of course, if you're going to be looking at multiple slides for, our, for an experiment where you need to um, compare intensities, you need to figure out which slide is your brightest one, set the exposure time for that brightest slide, and then not change it for your other samples so that they will all be relative to the brightest slide. So if you're doing that, always figure out which one's the brightest one first. You can do a quick screen. And then set your exposure time so that you have no saturation in that one, and then leave the exposure time the same for all the other slides. And you would have to do that for each color because each color gets a different exposure time. Now, there's a way that this software can automatically calculate the exposure time for you and leave some padding room for some error when you go to another part of the field. So here we have what says shift 70%. What this means is that it will aim to have the brightest pixel in your image be 70% of this full range. So we have 16,384. So it's going to go to approximately here and say this is going to be our brightest pixel. So if we say 70%, auto exposure, set exposure, it took a picture. Well, it didn't, didn't show it to us, but it took one. And now, if I hit snap with all the other channels turned off, that's how it's ranged. And you can see that there's no saturation. And you can see on this curve that it's peaking at approximately 70%. You, if you had a bleaching problem, you might say, well, instead of using 70%, I'm only going to use 30%. Because the camera is so low noise that if we didn't have this differential, if we only had the pixel values on the right, we actually wouldn't need such a low exposure. We don't have to fill the whole range. So we can go 30% on exposure, set exposure, and you can see in this picture at 30%, it looks dim, but if we adjust our contrast afterwards, it still has a great range because we actually don't need more than this thousand counts, right, where I'm dragging the mouse down in order to get a really nice image. So if you have a bleaching issue or for some other reason you don't want to use low exposure, Maybe you're going to be tiling in large areas and actually trimming 100 milliseconds off each exposure over large areas can save some time. You actually can have a very nice image without even getting near saturation or anything. So we would want to go through and do this for every color. So let's go to Daffy. And you don't even have to hit live to do this. You can just say that we're going to go for 70%, hit auto exposure, and say set exposure. And you can see it did a great job. And again, you may have some nuclei that are dimmer later on. You can say for display, you want to crank it brighter because that's the way you like the aesthetics of the image. I don't like it that way, but a lot of people love this high contrast. But the benefit of having no saturation here, you can see the range indicator clearly shows that, is that we can go through 
and segment the nuclei that are in focus of these, even some of the out of focus ones. If you had your raw data saturated, these nuclei would be blurred together, and there's no way to go through and count them or separate them as individual objects. So you can see where I'm circling the mouse. These are still oversaturated, but you're able to separate them. In this region here, you could not separate them. If you took them even brighter, you can see that they were together. But that's just the simulation, because here's the raw data with this really great range. You can go to the red and do the same thing. So let's just start just to give you an idea what happens when it's saturated. You think, oh, I'm seeing these cells great, but in reality, they're saturated and they will look bigger than they really are. If you try to do an area measurement, the areas will be measured much larger. So we want to make sure we don't saturate them. We can set this two ways, as I've shown you before. We can set it manually by just changing the exposure time by dragging it, or we can type in a number, let's say 70 milliseconds. Or we can go for this auto exposure. We can go again for this 70%, 30% range. Let's say let's make this range 50%. And I'm going to do it for the AF 647. I'm not even going to look at the image. I'm just going to say auto exposure at 50% range, set exposure. And now if we take all the channels, we have Daffy, Green, Red, and Harvard checked. It takes a picture where everything is within that range. We can split screen. We can clearly see everything's fine. You can also go in as to an individual channel later. So you can see for display later, we can do this. We just have to set our methods to show bright areas and we read labeled areas in the same image we apply in camera first. And you can do that. There are also people who will show this image, this green image, next to an image like this and say contrast adjusted linearly to show you these in relationship to each other. But if it's important to see, to actually be able to quantify what's going on in these, that's great. So let's look at this far red image for a second. Can actually zoom it up a little bit. Well, let's not do that. Sorry about that. If we do a really big gamma curve there, we can start to see their features in here on the lights. Expect these are backgrounds, but if you have good control slides, maybe this is real label. And if this is real label, what's great about having this linear range is now you can quantify the difference of intensity between these cells, which are very bright, and these cells, which are weak. So let's talk about one additional issue, which is saving the images. Always save your images in the format of the computer. Of the, I'm sorry, of the soft Microsoft software. You can save as CGI or as like save. Give it a, a useful name for your experiment. Something more useful than what I just named it there. And that's important because when you open these files in ImageJ or in Zen or other software to do quantification, you really need all these channels separate. This file type saves all the information about how we set up our exposure times um, and just about everything that you want. If you save it in another method, such as uh, TIP, you will lose all that information, and in the case of this fourth channel, you won't be able to separate the colors from the other channels. And in fact, this is not a pure blue for the DAPI. This would be have components that are in the main channel also. So you could not separate them to prevent quantification. The main points of this video was to show you multi-channel imaging with linear um, and contrast range across the whole image so that you can see everything from the brightest signal to the weakest signal.